With the coming of peace for the church, the art of the sarcophaguses began to be embellished with different episodes. The relationship between the various modes of expression became so close that in the representations engraved on the front of the sarcophaguses, the prayers of the early Christians can be unequivocally recognized. Hear my prayer, O Lord, just as you heard the prayer of Jonah from the belly of the whale. So hear me and snatch me from death to life. Hear my prayer, just as you heard the three youths, Anania, Azaria, and Misaele. The paradigms of salvation in the Old and the New Testaments merge. Beginning with the Felix Culpa of the proto-ancestors who represent the premise and cause of the plan for man's redemption. Then there are the healings of the blind and the lame, the prodigious resurrection that Ezekiel performs in the field of desiccated bones, and finally, the sacrifice of Isaac. The iconography contained in these decorations had a determining role in the diffusion of the new doctrine at a popular level. The images collaborate with the purpose of the catechism and heighten the story of salvation with their visual vocabulary. Sometimes, continuous phrases will propose an association between two separate subjects, one taken from the Old Testament, the other from the New, by way of testimony to biblical language. This mode of approach is evident on two sarcophaguses for children, which contain engravings of the resurrection of the bones and the epiphany on one, and the adoration of the Magi and Daniel condemned to the lions on the other. Apart from these exceptional cases, sarcophaguses with continuous friezes recall as many biblical stories as possible, sometimes without any particular connection between them, almost as if the desire were to recall the entire story of salvation to the mind of the deceased, who now has an active role in this story, by recounting all its details. Perusing the tomb cover for Crispina we see her depicted as in a simple and symbolic paradise, defined by two palm trees set in the midst of numerous biblical episodes, some recalling the childhood of the Savior with two suggestive scenes of the Epiphany and the manger. Another, the almost obligatory damnatio ad bestias, which occurred with the prophet Daniel. And others, the deliverance by the multiplication of the bread, the arrest of St. Peter, and the miracle of the baptismal spring. Looking at these images, we can almost hear the popular account in the apocryphal Acts. All the brothers wept, and the soldiers captured Peter and brought him before the judge, who ordered him crucified. Then a crowd of brothers came forth, rich and poor orphans and widows, the meek and the powerful, and they wished to free the apostle. But Peter calmed them, saying, Ye men who live in Christ, remember the mercy of God. Wait that he may come and give to each his task. From the 4th century on, the continuous frieze was arranged on two levels, so it might contain an even larger number of episodes. This gave rise to a rich vocabulary of salvation for the deceased, who were represented in the central tondo, circumscribed by an affectionate and moving embrace. To this type belongs the monumental dogmatic sarcophagus, so called for the exalted theological message that pours forth from its scenes. In terms of theological significance, the highest point is certainly the creation. The identity of the faces of the three characters is meant to express the unity of the three beings which at that time had become a matter of debate. The Trinitarian conception 
is restated by the depiction of the Epiphany located on the lower level, where the first of the three kings is pointing not to the usual star, but to three small circles which allude to three persons. The style that characterizes the decorations of these sarcophaguses is highly refined. Its deeply studied naturalness, the balanced classical style in the execution of the faces, reached their apex on what is known as the Sarcophagus of the Two Brothers. The episode with the resurrection of Lazarus visualizes the meeting between Christ and the sister of the deceased in a heart-rending and suspended depiction that seems almost to prefigure the sorrowful devotions of the Middle Ages. Amongst the episodes dedicated to the story of St. Peter, a new one stands out. It refers to the Apostle's depth of concentration while reading and how his prison guards looked him in the face and were converted shortly thereafter. It is a scene fully expressive of the power attributed to the Catechism. The words of St. Augustine come immediately to mind. The beauty of the images that through the soul are realized by the hands of the artist comes from that beauty which is above souls and for which night and day my soul yearns. Between the years 350 and 360, the style of funereal sculpture reached its apex with the celebrated sarcophagus of Junio Basso, considered the jewel of the so-called fine style that was typical of the Renaissance under Constantine. The front of this sarcophagus is divided into two orders of columns, reminiscent of a magnificent nave and tribune in one of the basilicas of the epoch. The architectural choices have been made with great care and eye to detail and include individual representations of lambs performing miracles. But the real innovation lies in the interruption of the continuous narration that was characteristic of the sculpture work of the preceding period. The scenes are held within various niches and point towards a Christological and Christocentric significance with a Maestas Domini, Christ seated in heaven between Peter and Paul, and the entry into Jerusalem. These images are strategically placed in the center of scenes that are rather familiar, but which here may be reassembled and seen as references to elevated theological values. Although the use of sarcophaguses was confined to a rather elevated social level of the Christian population, it still documents the figurative framework that was common to all social levels. Primitive Christian art had the function of catechism in a Christian society of limited literacy. The various scenes, then, represented a sort of biblia pauperum, a simple means that was widely understood and could evoke the vital episodes in the story of salvation. The various Paleo-Christian burial sites of the late 4th century offer us a panorama of the highly complex phenomenology of burial and culture. In the very new anticonformist spirit of equality, the simple burial sites of the ordinary departed lay side by side with those of the aristocracy and the ecclesiastic hierarchy, who, as we know, preferred burial within marble tombs. In this way, the burial sites along the main consular roads became valuable museums of a popular devotion and doctrine, which reaches its greatest expression in the artwork of the sarcophaguses where the irrepressible impulse towards resurrection and the potent device of representing the catechism in images are brought together. It is almost an anticipation of what Pope Gregory the Great was to write at the end of the sixth century. The catechism must be made up of images. 
what the scriptures explain to those who can read, art explains to everyone. And for this reason, religious images serve God's great people.